My name is Tom Schumacher. Uh, I'm a shareholder at Bakke Norman, and uh, I'm going to be the first speaker today. I'm going to talk about the uh, uh, complete change of the partnership law in Wisconsin. Uh, I know there's a lot of farm entities that are partnerships, either for part or all of their uh, business operations. So I'm going to kind of give you the highlights of that change. Uh, following uh, that presentation, uh, Tammy Skoglin from our office is going to talk about uh, tax updates and getting ready for the year-end tax planning uh, that's coming up. And then following that, uh, Sean Sima, who's sitting up here in front, uh, Sean is the CEO of Sima Flatemish and Ornstein, which is a uh, accounting firm uh, in the Twin Cities, but they also have an office out here in uh, New Richmond. And uh, Sean and I are going to tag team a little bit on just different business entities and some of the advantages and disadvantages of each of those entities when you're considering how you currently operate in the form of business operation that you have or as you diversify or as you uh, transfer to the next generation and they're going to decide how they're going to operate how those different business entities, both the advantages and disadvantages from how they would be set up, uh, as well as uh, uh, Sean will be able to talk more detail about the advantages and disadvantages from a tax aspect uh, for those various different forms of business entities. So, uh, and then uh, at the beginning of this, and I should say this at the beginning, the middle, and the end, um, I just wanted to thank uh, Janet King from our office. Janet's who checked you in at the, at the back, and Janet's the one who gets everything put together, uh, gets, the, gets the materials put together, gets the food put together, gets the location puts together, put together, and makes sure that I show up in the right place on the right day so that I can be here and, uh, and do what I'm, I'm, I'm going to do in connection with this. So thanks to Janet for doing that, as she does a wonderful job uh, every time we have one of these seminars. So let's talk a little bit about the, uh, uh, the new partnership law in Wisconsin. So this law was enacted back in March of this year, and uh, it's got kind of a different kind of a transition to make that, that law effective. And the partnership law in Wisconsin uh, prior to this change was based on the Uniform Partnership Act that was adopted back in 2014. Now, excuse me, not 2014, 1914. So uh, you can imagine from 1914 till today that there's been a lot of differences in the way uh, uh, the business world operates and the different types of entities that are, that are available in which you operate. And so the, uh, the existing law uh, that uh, this new law replaced has been around for a long time. And uh, I know that we've had a couple of... Uh, two or three different uh, litigation matters re, uh, regarding partnerships and the rights of the partners and uh, their obligation to each other and their obligations to the partnership. And the law as it existed had some ambiguity to it and there was uh, uh, some of the changes I think have helped clarify what those ambiguities were. In any event, uh, it was based on that law back in 1914. It was also updated somewhat when the uh, uh, reformed it in 1997, but they've now adopted a completely new uniform uh, partnership law. The idea is it's put together by a consortium, uh, and the thought is, is that for certain areas of law that they be similar across the United States. And so you have this consortium puts together the Uniform Act, and then each state will adopt it as, uh, as they see fit, and they can adopt it exactly as it's been promulgated, or they can make changes uh, based on what they think need to be changed for their individual state. Uh, the original law was enacted by all of the states except Louisiana. It's not unusual that Louisiana at times doesn't adopt things. They kind of came from the French uh, legal system, whereas uh, all the other states were pretty much based on the uh, English legal system. So it's not unusual that sometimes Louisiana is not included in that. But uh, all the other states have adopted it. On the other hand, this new updated version of the partnership law, there's only been a few states, Wisconsin being one of them, that has adopted uh, the various revisions. And the, the overall theme, I think, behind that, uh, those changes are to bring partnership law 
more in line with the other types of business entities. So bringing it more in line with limited liability companies and uh, corporations, such that you think of a partnership more as a distinct entity. It has some more uh, filing requirements uh, so that there's notice to third parties about what's going on. And then it addresses uh, uh, some of the things that you can change. Uh, you know, there's default provisions that are in the statute uh, that have been adopted. And then there is, uh, you know, you can have a partnership agreement. Some of those default provisions that are in the statutes can be changed by the partnership agreement. Uh, others uh, you're not allowed to change and there's some restrictions on what you can do in the partnership agreement. Uh, let's talk a little bit just first about the effective date of this. As I said, it was adopted in, uh, uh, enacted in March of this year and then it had an effective date of July 1st of 2016, so a few months ago in the middle of the summer. That date, after that date, any partnership that exists in Wisconsin has the ability to opt in and decide that it's going to be governed by the new law. Okay, so today if you have a general partnership uh, you can adopt and say you want to opt in and you want the new law to govern uh, your particular partnership. So that's at July 1st uh, of this year. On January 1st of 2018, so another what, 18 months from now, uh, the, not even 18, uh, that law, the new law will be apply to all partnerships across the board. It won't matter if you already existed as a partnership or if you're a new partnership that uh, is formed after that January 1, 2018 date. So it'll apply to everybody. You do have the option, however, if you're an existing partnership today and you do not want to be governed by the new law, uh, as of Janu January 1st, 2018, that you have the option to file an election with the Department of Financial Institutions, DFI in Madison. You can file an election to not be governed by the new law. So there's this transition period where you have the opportunity to opt in now. Uh, uh, you, have, you will be required to uh, be governed by the law in January, January 1 of 18 but you have the option to opt out at that particular time. So there's an opt-in period now and an opt-out period, and you have to make that opt-out election before the effective date of January 1st, 2018. So by December 31st of next year, if you do not want to be governed by the new law, then uh, you have to make that election and make that filing. So as I said, the, one of the kind of the overall themes of this Uniform Act is that uh, it now treats a partnership much more uh, in line with the other business entities in which you can operate, limited liability companies uh, or corporations. Uh, and so today under the, well, under the new law, or excuse me, under the old law, if you owned a piece of partnership property, whether it's real property or personal property, equipment, whatever it is, the partners own that as tenants in, com or tenants in partnership. So that's similar to tenants uh, in common that you uh, might be familiar with with respect to real estate. So if you were uh, four partners and you had a piece of real estate, your ownership would be as tenants in partnership and you'd each have a one-fourth interest in that and that's how the title would be. And similarly, that's how you would own uh, the personal property. Under, under the new law, they treat a partnership as a separate and distinct entity. So if you have a piece of real estate, that piece of real estate will be owned by the partnership. So if you've got the Sima and Schumacher building partnership, that's how the title will be. It will be held in the name of the partnership as a separate and distinct entity. As, as members of the partnership, if Sean and I are members, the two uh, partners in that partnership, we get our ownership interest by virtue of the fact that we are partners in the partnership. Similar to the concept of we, if you are a limited liability company, you have an ownership in the limited liability company assets by virtue of being a member of the limited liability company. You don't own the asset individually, you own it as a member of the LLC. Or if you're a corporation, you have an ownership interest in the assets of the corporation, not you individually, but you have it as being a shareholder in the corporation. So now what they've done is they've changed partnership law to be similar to what it is for limited liabilities. 
li limited liability companies and for corporations. Your ownership interest isn't as tenants in partner partnership or tenants in partnership. It's as a partner in the partnership entity, and the partnership entity is the entity that owns those particular assets. So it's it's moving it more in line with the other forms of business organization uh, that we have in Wisconsin. A partnership uh, can, but is not required to have a partnership agreement. And I am certain that there are hundreds, if not thousands, or many thousands of partnerships in Wisconsin that have no written partnership agreement. And uh, if there is, uh, if it's fairly straightforward, uh, if the partners never disagree about anything, if the partners agree what happens when somebody uh, dies, if the partners agree what happens if somebody disagrees, if the partners have uh, understand and can work out what happens if one of them gets divorced and the other spouse wants part of their partnership interest, really don't need a written partnership agreement. Uh, and generally, uh, you know, like I say, if everybody agrees on everything, no need for the agreement. Uh, but where we, where we see it and, and on the back end uh, is that there is no agreement. And one partner thinks this was the agree this was the deal, this was the terms, and the other partner, for whatever reason, doesn't agree to that. And that's, uh, that really leads to full employment for lawyers. Uh, if it's a small uh, financial matter, it doesn't, but typically, uh, you know, if a partnership is successful, has significant assets, has significant benefits to the partners, and then they disagree, uh, it's very difficult, it's very expensive to resolve those disagreements when there is no, uh, there is no written partnership agreement. So the partnership agreement generally is going to govern the relationship between the partners and also the relationship between the partners and the partnership entity itself. It's going to describe what business uh, the partnership is going to be engaged in and what the conditions are for changing that business or amending the partnership and amending the uh, agreement as to what the relationship is between the partners and the partners and the partnership. The new law provides some restrictions on what you can do in your partnership agreement. So uh, there's provisions in the statute that relate to expulsions of partners and how that happens by court order. Uh, what are the things that cause the dissolution of a partnership? the rules for winding up the partnership, uh, what documents have to be required with, uh, what documents are required to be filed with the Department of Financial Institutions, uh, how lawsuits are commenced by partners and how lawsuits are commenced against partners and the partnership, uh, the rights to the access of the partnership books, uh, the fiduciary responsibilities between the partners, all of those uh, relationships and all those requirements are set forth in the statute and only with limited exceptions are you able to modify those in your partnership agreement. Uh, today, or un well, under the old law, and today if, uh, if you haven't opted into the new law, there really are no statutory filings for a partnership. If you have a limited liability company, you have to file your articles of organization, you have to file your annual statement uh, uh, once a year uh, with the Department of Financial Institutions. If you're a corporation, you have to file your uh, articles of incorporation, uh, and again, you have the annual statement to be filed on an annual basis. Uh, so that doesn't really change under uh, the new partnership law, you're not required uh, to file anything to form a partnership. You can just be a partnership. But there are now provisions that allow you to file what's called a statement of partnership authority. And this is a document that you would file with the uh, Department of Financial Institutions that will provide some notice to third parties that in fact you are a partnership and you're operating as a partnership. And in that statement of authority, you can designate which individuals have authority to act for the partnership, or you can de designate which position in the partnership has the authority to act for the partnership with respect to partnership matters. 
And once that statement is filed, that's effective for five years after the filing date as notice to uh, third parties of who has the ability to act for the partnership. You know, that's all, there's always some question in people's mind, uh, third parties that are dealing with the partnership, is who really has the authority to act. If, you, if you've got a corporation, you know, it's generally it's the board of directors uh, make, you know, manage the uh, entity, and it's the officers, who, you know, the president, secretary, treasurer, one or more than one of those uh, uh, officers are the ones, the CEO, have the authority to act for the corporation. But if you're a third party dealing with a partnership, a lot of times you don't know that because there are no filings with respect to that. So the new law provides that you can file this statement of authority that indicates who has the ability to act uh, for the corporation. Excuse me, act for the partnership. There's also provision uh, under the old law, you could, you could file with the Register of Deeds in the county in which the partnership operates, you could file your partnership agreement, and you could file a uh, notice of amendments to that, and you could file a notice that the partnership is being terminated. There was no requirement to do that, uh, but you were, you were permitted to do that, and sometimes that's, that's happened. I have seen those on uh, real estate records uh, that we've examined or that there's title insurance on that, you know, gives the third parties uh, the understanding of who can act for the partnership. So now, under the new law, you can take and file this statement of authority that you file with the Department of Financial Institutions. You can also file a copy of that of the Register of Deeds Office in the county where the partnership operates so that you know who has the authority to act for the partnership. A couple of other uh, statements that now uh, are forms uh, that can be filed with the Department of Financial Institutions to again give information to uh, third parties is a statement of dissociation. And dissociation uh, means basically notice to uh, who is no longer a partner. Let the world know who no, uh, one of the partners is either uh, for various reasons, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, is no longer associated with the partnership. So you can file that with the Department of Financial Institutions. You can file a statement of dissolution so people know that the, uh, the partnership is being dissolved and they're in the process of winding up the partnership affairs. And when that's concluded, you can file a statement of termination to say that the partnership no longer exists. So those, again, are optional filings. They're not required, but they're optional filings to uh, give notice to third parties much the same way that the filings for limited liability companies or corporations uh, give notice to third parties uh, currently. Uh, the new law, uh, again, addresses uh, uh, the kind of the fiduciary responsibilities between, between the partners. Uh, I don't know that this is... Uh, any real change from existing law other than I think they cleaned up uh, the language with respect to that and uh, you know just codified the fact of the requirement that partners have a duty of loyalty and care to the other partners and the partnership and they have the obligation of good faith and uh, fair dealing in dealing with each other and with the partnership and so uh, I give some examples in here of things that uh, the partners can and cannot do, but as, as a, those two concepts of loyalty uh, and care to the partners and the partnership and an obligation of good faith and fair dealing. In other words, you can't do things that, uh, as a partner, that you have a conflict of interest in. Uh, uh, you can't do things in which you steal a partnership op business opportunity that's really an opportunity for the business itself and then you take that and you go over here and you use it on your own you make the profit from it when in fact it should have been the profit that went to the partnership so uh, that that language has now been uh, uh, codified the new concept that is new to partnership law but is not new to uh, uh, Wisconsin law generally is the idea of dissociation dissociation uh, it took me a while figure out how to pronounce that word when it first came in, but it was, uh, it's initially and it's currently in the law with respect to limited liability companies. It talks, it refers to the concept of when in a limited liability company or in a partnership where the partner no longer is a partner or where the member is no longer a member of the limited liability company. So that 
that is now part of uh, partnership law, and it was not in the past. Uh, under current law, uh, a partnership will be dissolved upon the happening of some events. And those events would be the partners can just agree to dissolve the partnership. Uh, the death of one of the partners dissolves the partnership. The bankruptcy of one of the partners uh, dissolves the partnership. Uh, if a partner assigns their interest or sells their interest to a different uh, individual, that may not necessarily uh, dissolve the partnership. So dissolution is one concept. The other concept, though, related to that is the idea of dissociation. And that really refers to the individual partner. So a dissociation occurs when a partner withdraws from the partnership or it gets expelled from the partnership, either under the statute for statutory reasons or under the partnership agreement. Um, when a partner files bankruptcy, that's an act of dissociation. When a partner dies or gets a guardian appointed or is uh, a judge to be incapable of performing their duties with respect to the partnership, that's an act of dissociation. And when the partnership dissolves, that, uh, that also is an act of dissociation with respect to all of the partners. And during that process of winding up the partner that may be in charge of doing that, their obligation is not to continue the business, but basically to wind it up, to liquidate the assets, to pay the creditors, and to, to uh, make the final distributions, if any, uh, to the partners. Uh, let me just see here. In the existing law prior to this year, there was the idea of uh, wrongful, uh, wrongful termination of the partnership or wrongful uh, withdrawal from the partnership, wrongful removal from the partnership. And I know in a couple of the cases that we had, there was real confusion about what that what that really meant and what, what liability uh, did a partner have. So say you have a partnership agreement that spells out how people get in and get out and somebody just says, well, I don't care what the agreement says, I'm out of here and I'm, I'm just leaving. And uh, now uh, what the law says, the current, the new uh, version of the law provides that uh, if a partner does that, they're going to be liable to the partnership for the damages they caused for that wrongful dissociation or leaving of the partnership. And I think that clears up an issue that was um, ambiguous, or the statutory language was ambiguous uh, under, the old, uh, under the old law. One of the big issues with respect to partnerships is liability exposure. So in a normal uh, partnership, all of the partners are liable for the debts and obligations of the partnership. And they're also liable for damages for uh, damages that are caused by a partner that's acting in the ordinary course of the partnership. So that's one of the reasons why people go into limited liability companies. That's one of the reasons why uh, entities or foreign risk corporations is to protect the individuals and the individual's assets from uh, liability from third parties. However, in, so to deal with that in the partnership arena, uh, Wisconsin has a limited liability partnership that exists today. And all that is required for a general partnership is, I keep hitting the keyboard, I guess, so that, uh, there we go. Thanks. Uh, a limited liability partnership, all you have to do is you have to file a statement with DFI saying you want to be a limited liability partnership. And the effect of that is, is that gives you the protection from those third party claims against the partnership. So uh, it's fairly simple. It's a one page document. You file it and you really don't need to do anything more than that. The, uh, the new law is uh, continues that uh, limited liability uh, opportunity, uh, but now uh, you have to file it on an annual basis. They've changed the name of, of what that document is actually called, 
and they've expanded the uh, concept. Uh, if you, do, they've expanded the concept that if you have the apparent authority to act for the partnership, you then uh, are going to have that liability, even if you're not a partner. If you act as if you uh, under an apparent authority, you're going to have that liability. You won't be liable for those acts, however, if it is a limited liability uh, partnership. So uh, most of the general partnerships that I've seen uh, have made that election to file that form, and that continues on under the new law. One of the uh, uh, things in recent years uh, that has been adopted in Wisconsin is just the ability to merge or combine different entities. So merge a uh, partner or a limited liability company with another limited liability company or merge a corporation with a limited liability company. So it's talked about cross species. So limited liability companies, corporations, now partnerships will also be able to merge uh, from a legal standpoint with those other types of entities. The thing that has to be remembered in that context is that there are a whole uh, myriad of tax consequences generally to those mergers that this partnership law doesn't deal with at all. All that the partnership law provides is that, in fact, yes, you can have that merger, you can combine those entities, but you really, if, it, if you're ever looking at doing that, you really ought not step into that unless you've taken and you know, talk to the accountant and figure out all the various tax consequences that are going to occur uh, with respect to that uh, with respect to that merger. One uh, uh, kind of last item uh, with respect to books and records, and you know, you have these provisions in the statutes generally because uh, they're trying to regulate what happens when people get into a fight. And uh, the books and records, I've had this uh, not in the partnership concept, but in the uh, in the partnership arena, but in the corporate arena where, you know, the shareholders are fighting and they, they want to get a copy of the list of shareholders, they want to get a copy of, you know, the financial statements, they want to get a copy of the corporate record book. And uh, in the uh, old version under uh, the uh, uh, partnership statute, uh, you just had, you must, you were required to make those available and a partner could get them at any time. The change in the law has been that now they simply have to be at the principal place of business, which they did in the past, but you, you, have, you can make those books and records available on reasonable notice at a reasonable time, and it's not, the partner no longer has the opportunity to just kind of show up and say, I want it now, and you know, at whatever time they might do that. So that's a, that brings that in line with the way that uh, records are available under a limited liability company or a corporation. So. That's kind of the end of uh, those, my comments with respect to that law. I think uh, the thing to keep in mind is that if you do have a partnership, that the law has changed, and that law may have an impact on how you operate. It may have an impact on your liability as a partner. And so uh, you need to consider that and uh, think about how that the new law may apply to you. Keep in mind that as of today, you have the opportunity, if you choose to opt in, to be covered under the new law. But if you do nothing, and it's now February 1st of 2018, you will be governed by that law because it became effective and applies to all partnerships as of January 1st. If you do not want the new law to apply to you, then you have to make an election and file a statement with the uh, Department of Financial Institutions prior to January 1st of, uh, of 2018.